Okay, who's ready for chapter four? Uh, do you remember that Hendrik fell in the water last time and he lied to um, Joyce's dad about what happened? And remember Joyce said, hmm, I like him, but I can't trust him because he lies. So he's not, his word is not, um, I can't, I can't trust him. Like his word is not worth valuing that way because I heard him lie. I know what happened and he lied. So now I know that I can't trust him. Uh, so sometimes it's funny. It's like, we think like little things, like little lies. It's like, but for other people, it's like, hmm, they didn't tell the truth about that. Now I know I can't trust them about something else. Like in the little things, what about the big things, right? So George keeps that in mind, which is going to come in here. What do you think? Okay, so chapter four, the old men. Ready? Three days later, the Verhagen family were having dinner when Freda's barking warned them of his visitor and Henry burst in the room. They've taken Mr. Poot and Ernest, and Ernest, he cried, the SS men this morning. Seeing the incredulous horror on the faces before him, he elaborated. The aviators had been hiding in Mr. Poot's barn. The Germans came this morning blowing their sirens. Do you guys remember the parachutes with the aviators that remember the plane that got um, hit and it fell? Excuse me. They banged on the door. They could hear it from our farm. We could hear it from our farm. I saw everything from the window of our hayloft. They took all three aviators and Mr. Poot and Ernest as well. Mrs. Poot wouldn't let them go. She cried and held on to Ernest. Then one of the SS men hit her with his gun. She's badly hurt. The doctor is with her. Okay, so here, let me see if I can zoom in on this, a picture of Hendrick coming to tell the family about what he saw. So there's the family and there's Hendrick telling them everything, okay? Poor woman, said mother softly. Father wanted to go right away to see what was being done for Mrs. Poot. The boys clamored to go with him. They set off along the dike, following the main road, which brought them to the proper entrance to the farm. Hendrick dropped off to his home, seeming reluctant to go with them. A brooding sense of fear hung over the Poot farm as they entered it. The maid let them in. Her eyes were red from weeping. She spoke in a hushed voice. The remains of a half-finished breakfast, which no one had had the spirit to clear away, bore testimony to the rude interruption of normal living. We can't understand it, the maid sobbed. Master made a beautiful hideout. The Germans walked right past it before. And then this morning, the master and young Ernest could come in. And the mistress out of her mind, oh, I just can't get over it. I had just served the master as an egg. He never even finished it. And the maid burst into tears again. Father had had a few words with Dr. DeVries, who, had, who was attending Mrs. Poot by taking care of her because she was hurt and upset. Dr. DeVries said she would be all right. She was suffering mostly from shock and grief. Though her jaw was badly swollen from where the rifle blow and several teeth had been knocked loose. She's worrying about the farm, he said. With Albert and Ernest gone, there is no one to harvest the crops. Father immediately assured him that he could put Mrs. Poot's mind at rest there. I'll get help and manage it for her, he said. They went to look at the hole in the barn. Other people were there already. It was indeed an ingenious hiding place under the floor. The trap door had been concealed under a mound of hay. Joris caught murmurs to the effect that the Schneiderhans farm was the only place from which the prisoners could have been observed when they came out for an airing, and that it was not difficult to guess where the Germans had got their information. Hmm. Dirk Jan stayed to help father, but Joris was sent home to tell mother that they would be working for Mrs. Poot. On the way home, Joris kept thinking of Ernest. He was in Dirk Jan's class and Joris wondered what the Germans would do with him. So he's, so the boy that was arrested is just three years older than Joris because he's the same age as Joris's older brother. Would he have to go to prison? Would he have to sit in a cell all day? Or would he have to work? The aviators would go to a camp, of course. When you were in the army, you were treated better. Joris remembered the flaming airplane and the little white bubbles floating after it. He saw them again. 
the bubbles. Remember how the parachutes look like bubbles? So he was picturing them in his mind and he saw them again. One, two, three, four. Yes, four. He remembered it now distinctly. There were four white bubbles. How many aviators had they captured? Only three. Hmm. When Joris had given mother his message and told her all the news, he sent him to get mushrooms. She sent him to get mushrooms. There are many along the dike, she said. I can dry them and they'll be a real treat this winter as a change from the usual cabbage and potatoes. Joris was glad to go. He took Freya with him. The pup loved to be taken out and jumped along around ecstatically. She could not understand why Joris wanted to stop all the time to pick those funny little white buttons that he did not taste nice, that did not taste nice. But since she liked them, she would help him. She sniffed around and when she would find one, she would stand guard over it, looking absurdly proud of herself. Joris patted and praised her, at which she bounded off to look for more. Joris had never filled his basket quite so quickly. So Frey is a good help with the mushrooms. He stretched and looked about. So this is Joris looking around. He had walked further than he thought. The old giant loomed quite close. He suddenly longed to see what it was like on the inside. He vaguely remembered visiting there once when the Demille was still working. That was before the war. He hadn't been more than four then. It was a shadowy memory, but he remembered plainly that a kind lady had given him a candy with red stripes and a peppery taste, and that there was a big gray cat who had purred when Joris had stroked her. Joris jumped across the ditch, scrambled over the dike that divided the Norderar from the Rheinstadter polder. He crossed a rickety bridge. You could see the water through the missing planks, and he warned Fran to be careful. He pushed aside the branches of some overgrown lilac trees, Pushing, putting down his basket, he told Freya to guard it. Like, stand guard of the mushrooms, Freya. Then he tried one of the doors. A mill always has two doors because one can be made useless by the wings moving in front of it. The door was locked. He walked around the mill. The big wheel which had wound the cap was broken. There were missing spokes and a bird had built a nest in it. It was empty. Joris peered through the windows but they were dirty and full of cobwebs. He could see nothing. He walked to the other door and tried that. This time, after some pushing, the door yielded. Opening it, he disturbed some cobwebs which drifted down. It was dark inside. A greenish twilight filtered through the dirty windows. A mouse zipped past him and there was a scratching and a rustling behind the walls. George's heart hammered. There was something about this mill that suddenly drilled him with, filled him with dread but he resolutely told himself that that was nonsense. He could hear the, his clogs echo hollowly through the building. The boards creaked under him and seemed to give way here and there. He looked into the kitchen. A rusty stove still stood there, beside some piled willow baskets and a chair without a bottom. A cracked earthenware pot stood on a shelf, joined to a wall and, seal, and ceiling by black cobwebs. Wallpaper hung down in strips, the walls had a pattern of green mold on them. A calendar with spotted yellow pages hung crookedly from a nail. It bore a date in large letters, February, 1938. The next room was completely empty except for a litter of moldy rags. The last room, the living room, seemed less desolate than the others. The windows were a little cleaner. There were not so many cobwebs. The doors of the press bed were half open and he could see an old mattress in it with straw, 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 straw sticking out of its holes. Joris felt he ought to go now and carry his mushrooms home to mother, but something kept prodding him. What about the stairs? He'd seen the stairs out of the corner of his eye. They'd been swathed in cobwebs and he shuddered away from them. His mind told him that it only looked scary, that the worst he could expect were spiders or bats and he'd better go up. The cobwebs weren't as bad as he had feared. He did not have to break his way through them. When he came to the first landing, he got a fright. With an eerie shriek like the sound of a siren, a, a dark shape hurled itself against him. Joris felt a sharp pain in his chest. He clutched at the shape to push it off, felt the reassuring softness of fur. He sat down on the landing with a long whistling sigh of relief. Oh, it was only a cat. 
He began to stroke the terrified animal and soon a deep purr came from the cavern of her body. Doris wondered whether it was the same cat who had lived here years ago. Could she have existed by herself all these years, refusing to leave her home? He was beginning to feel more at ease when a creaking board above him startled him. There was something moving in the top attic. What should he do? Should he run? He wanted to, but Father always said, face difficulties, don't avoid them. That way, he'll conquer them. Clasping the cat, whose warm purring gave him courage, he crept cautiously up the stairs. After each step, he listened. There was no more noise. Instead, it was so still that the cat's purring sounded like the drone of a bomber. Moisture broke out on Joris's forehead and the skin of his scalp prickled. He quickly mounted the last few steps. He did not know what he expected to find, but all he saw was broken machinery. The mill's wind shaft lay abandoned on the floor and the hole in the cap in which it had fitted was open, letting through clean daylight. A current of air swayed the cobwebs which hung everywhere in garlands. A roll of moldy sails lay tucked away in the shadow with coils of rope beside it. Joris was just beginning to laugh at himself for his fears when the sails heaved. Something was stirring under the wool, probably another cat, Joris thought to himself. Again, he felt a temptation to run. Why did that obstinate tyrant inside him drive him on? He explored as far as the top attic now, hadn't he? Why should he have to poke his nose under the sailcloth? No one would know, he could sneak off but he'd know it himself. He'd always know till the end of his days that he'd been a coward at the last moment. Drawing a deep breath, he moved forward and lifted up a sail. It was wrenched out of his hand as a dark figure dashed from underneath it and made a bolt for the stairs. Joris cried out in fright and the figure turned and looked at him. The light of the open hole fell full on the crumpled English aviator's uniform and the stubbly growth of beard on the haggard face. Two fierce brown eyes glittered into Joris's wide open blue ones while a shaky hand pointed a pistol at him. So they stood for a long second, taut with fear, every nerve stretched. Joris sent up silent prayers any moment now and his shot might end his life. Then the aviator slowly lowered his weapon and grinned. It was a wide infectious grin that gave a sunny look to his face. It was too absurd to be frightening to a little 10-year-old boy in faded red jersey or to be frightened of a thin 10-year-old boy in a faded red jersey with sunburnt legs stuck in rough clogs and arms tightly clasping around a huge gray cat. So the aviator's like, oh my gosh, how could I be afraid of this little boy? Joris's smile answered his, beginning tremulously at the corners of his mouth and then spreading over his whole face so that his freckled nose wrinkled up and the gap between his front teeth showed. The two shook hands. They had established a bond over a gulf of different ages and nationalities. Some instinct told them that they could trust each other. The aviator introduced himself as Charles King and Joris introduced him, told him his own name. After some unsuccessful attempts to make himself understood in English, Charles resorted to pantomime you know what a pantomime is, uh, and made a motion of eating, rubbing his stomach, like saying, I'm hungry, like, like mm, hungry. Then he put his finger on his lips and winked. Joris understood as well as if Charles had talked. He nodded his head and tried to show with motions that he would do his best to get him some food. The aviator plucked at his uniform and Joris nodded again. An ordinary closer would be more of a chance for Charles to escape. The aviator again put his fingers to his lip and Joris, like, and Joris crossed his heart and nodded, like saying, I promise, I'm not going to give you up. It's okay. Then Charles sat down on the steps and wiped his face with his handkerchief. Joris put the cat on Charles' knees. Like, you think about it, like this aviator, he doesn't know, Joris, he doesn't know if he'll go home and tell his mom and dad, what if his mom and dad are, like, German, like, they like the Germans. What if he doesn't know? So he's, he's taking a big chance here. Joris now went past Charles down the stairs. The aviator grinned again and held up his middle and forefinger in the sign of V for victory. Joris grinned back and made the V sign too for victory. Then he hurried down, still slightly trembly in the knees. Freya was overjoyed to see him and jumped all over him, but Joris did not pay much attention to her. 
He picked up his basket and walked home deep in thought. What chance had Charles King to escape? If the Germans did not look for him, he might be safe enough and they seemed satisfied with the three aviators they had caught. No one but Joris seemed to have seen the four fair parachutes floating down. Wait a minute, someone else had seen it. Of course, Hendrik Schneiderhans. And that, my dears, is the end of chapter four. The chapter comes to an end with that, where we're left wondering what's going to happen. The next chapter is chapter five, and it's called Shadows. So thank you guys. I love you.